The Delta Striker HD 1-6x24 second focal plane LPVO is a scope that I reviewed about two years ago. It's a wonderful scope that I praised up and down, and I've recommended it to more people than I can count. But, like so many other people, I had the same question. Can the 4.5 to 30 by 56 HPVO bigger brother, can it stand up to its smaller brother's perfection? Well, there's only one way to find out. So why don't you come along for the ride and find out if this thing is worth its price point or not. Speaking of price point, before we get into the full physical overview and unboxing, you can find these for around 1600 bucks. And that's a pretty decent price. There are a couple of retailers that have these available. You can find them for a little bit less, a little bit more, but more or less they're going to be about $1,600. They are made in Japan, and they do seem pretty nice from an external standpoint. From an internal standpoint, you can see the scope just sort of rides on that cardboard rib in the middle, and it's not as fine-fitting as a lot of foam options from other manufacturers. The finish on this is more of like a matte satin finish, and it does keep a lot more of the grime and grit from everything else on it as opposed to like a more shiny finish. The weight comes in about 35.5 ounces, which is roughly what they claim on their website. They claim on their website 35.7. To bring in a competitor, this is the Razer HD 4.5 to 27. It is significantly heavier and something you will see uh, shortly. To bring in another competitor, it is the Bushnell Match Pro ED, or the MPED for short. This comes in even lighter and is going to be one of its main rivals. I want to let the onboard audio play for this next segment to give you a better understanding of what's going on. Starting at the back, we have a fast focus eyepiece. Ooh, hear that? A little grainy in there. Ooh. The owner of the scope told me after I had already filmed this that he got caught in a torrential thunderstorm and unfortunately dropped his rifle in a pile of sand, which is why this thing is as chunky and crunchy as it is. There is a little bit more play in the back of the eyepiece, though, which is a little bit more than I would like. On to the magnification ring. We have the minimum at 12 o'clock and the maximum just around 6 o'clock. It's a little bit off. It's like 1 or 2 degrees off. Really not that much. Unlike the eyepiece, this is really smooth and easy to turn. It requires a good m amount of effort. Don't get me wrong, it's not like it's going to just spin freely, but it feels really well damped. And there is provisions for a cattail, which does make your life a lot easier if you have to move in a hurry. As for our illumination control, we have 1 through 11 with offs in between each spot. Good feel, good lockup. Very little play in the detents. It's nice. Not bad at all. Pulling off the cap for the illumination is a little tricky because the cap and the body of the knob itself are very similarly sized. And there isn't a lot of space over here to really grab it with your other finger. A standard CR2032 battery is found inside. And we have a standard six prong battery compartment. There is a nice O-ring on the back shoulder on the cap and it seems to lock up pretty well. The side focus on this goes down to 23 yards, which is great for a lot of you rimfire shooters, and all the way up to infinity. It actually goes just shy of 360 degrees, which is really nice to see. This is really well damped, requires a good amount of force to turn. We hear a little bit of a grind in there, I, I'm, presume, I'm presuming the same substance that was found in the rear eyepiece. But it feels and sounds very good otherwise. Both the windage and elevation turrets are locking. The, indi the indicator on the windage is above the 3 o'clock position. I'm not the biggest fan of that, but it doesn't really matter ultimately if you're just going to hold. They do that so this way it doesn't hopefully get obscured by the cap of either a ring or a mount. Lift up. Good solid feel and sound. Positive click. And a little bit of play in the detent, but ultimately definitely in the realm of acceptable. No problem locking it whatsoever. One thing I don't like is that when you unlock the cap, there is a gap between the cap and the body itself, and there's no line to help you line up exactly where you are. I'm a big fan of having consistency, so you know if there's a line in between here that if you want 
okay, you can easily see where the line jettisons across. It's just a little added expense, which they felt the need not to do. As far as the elevation turret, it's basically the exact same, except you get this really cool big nub in the middle, which acts as your rotation indicator. So we're at zero, I'm gonna go up. That's one, one full rotation. You can see it coming up right there. Two full rotations, so 20 mils. Let's keep going. Three full rotations and plus two. So again, same feel, same sound. Very nice. As far as how to adjust this, you got this collar on top, which you got to unscrew. There we go. You can see there's a, actually there's two big old O-rings on the outside surface, so you don't have to worry about water egress. Hopefully, some decent sized threads on the erector cap should just slide right off. You have another O-ring on the inside over here. Then you have your zero stop. You have a nice big old brass erector in there. Look at that. It's actually quite gorgeous. If you want to adjust your zero or your zero stop, you loosen up the set screw. You lock that in clockwise till it hits the stop. That is your zero stop. As far as resetting your zero on this, it's as simple as just lining it back up and you're done. The anodizing on this is very nicely done as well. It feels good in hand and feels pretty solid. You can see, however, it does wipe a little bit of the nail off, a little bit of rubbing right there on the front bell, but it does clean up well enough. Well enough. But holding the scope and feeling it and using it is one part of the experience. The other part, which is arguably probably more important, is how well everything else works when you're looking through it. So let's get behind this thing and see what it's like to actually use. Actually getting the chance to look through it now, here at 4.5x, you can see that the, hold on, let me get this right, LRD-1T reticle looks pretty good. And that is because it's at 4.5x. I've had a lot of problems with some more recent, like 3 to 18 MPVOs where the reticle doesn't really become noticeable until about 5x. So at least here, it looks pretty good, especially with those posts at 3, 6, and 9. But there's a couple of things odd about this scope. One is the reticle, because as we increase the magnification, you'll see we have crosses at the one mil intersections. But the other one is that right there, ladies and gentlemen. The top like four X or so gets extremely tight. I mean, unusably tight. That darkening is something you're going to notice throughout this entire video. And I think think part of that has to do with the actual eye relief. At minimum, it's rated at 3.2 inches and at maximum 3.8 inches. And it's just like, uh, that's a huge, huge swing. At least the illumination is kind of noticeable. And I l prefer that they chose the center crosshair as opposed to the entire thing. At least it looks, you know, somewhat usable. The turrets are very good. Good to like very good. There is a little bit of play, but that's not even worth mentioning, really. They sound good. They feel good. I'm not the biggest fan of the plunger. It's just I'd rather just a zero stop and like, you know, a, a rev indicator. And I'm not the biggest fan of the hash marks either. They sort of just get a little confusing in the middle. If your quote unquote precision rifle scope doesn't track well, it kind of really can't be a precision scope then, can it? So on to the tracking test. There is a little bit of play that I immediately noticed with the windage and the elevation. It's about a half tenth of a mil off. And you might not notice that unless you have it on something as rigid as this, where you can do a little test back and forth, but it's there. It does climb up to 10 mils more or less perfectly. It's about 1% off, but you could see it's favoring the right side of my target, the reticle. But I think that could just be the fact that maybe I didn't clock this 100% perfect. Again, all of this is done by eye, so it could be very slightly off. But there is a little bit of play in both the windage and elevation erectors. The big problem is going to be if you were to adjust your zero from 
up to down, then down to up, you might have about that half a tenth of player or so that I was talking about. Ultimately, it's not the end of the world, but I have seen better. So tracking-wise, honestly, it's fine. You'll probably never notice that sort of slop in the erectors unless you have it on something as rigid as my setup. And truth be told, is it really that much of a difference? Not really. But keep in mind, folks, this is, again, a serving size of one. You might have one that's tighter. You might have one that's looser. It's unfortunately just the nature of the beast. Image quality. At 4.5x here at 30 yards on a very bright, sunny, beautiful day, we have a very wonderful looking image. And with an indicated field of view of about 24.75 feet at 100 yards, it's going to be basically completely 100% average against everything we're going to compare this to, with the exception of just one, but we'll talk about that when we get there. As far as how much of the scope body we see, like we already looked at briefly on the vertical overview, it's perfectly adequate. But the view looking through it is a little bit on the smaller side, and that will become blatantly apparent very soon. As will the blatant apparentness of how dark the image gets once we get up into the higher magnification. Again, from 25 to 30, you start noticing a very steep drop off as far as light transmission coming through this thing. And no matter what position you get in, it's going to be there. I spent a long time tweaking the overall eye relief for this thing set to the camera, and this is as good as it got. And to the naked eye, I think it's easily as bad, if not a touch worse. Talking about the reticle real quick before we get into any sort of greater distances, I'm not the biggest fan of the crosses at the one full mill mark, and I'm not the biggest fan of having the numbers inboard of the elevation drops. I'd rather them be to the outside because they do take up a lot of the image over there, especially if you're focusing on smaller targets out at distance and you want to hold. Also, with the windage line, the center crosshair is fine, but then you have those two big pluses. It's like, where are those pluses? Is it at a half a, half a mil and then three quarters of a mil and then a full mil? It's just... It's a little sloppy and not as easy to pick up automatically. You know, there's some rifle scopes you get behind, and the reticles just like, oh, I know exactly what I'm looking at. I know exactly what they're trying to do here. With this, it's sort of, it's sort of funky, and it's not funky in a good sort of way. Pushing ourselves out to 400 yards, we have, again, a very wonderful looking image. And the side focus does line up very closely to the distances that we are paying attention to, both at 30 yards and here at 400 yards as we slowly increase the magnification to full. The image gets really nice to about 25x, and then it gets darker like we've seen, but then the chromatic aberration really, really creeps in. I adjust the side focus ever so slightly to see if I can get any more out of it, but truth be told... The number that you see is basically the number that you're going to need to be at. So that's really nice to see, but the image really isn't all that stellar. We do lose a little bit of contrast, and the colors do seem pretty good, but ultimately the chromatic aberration that creeps up is very apparent, but nothing is as bad as just how much darker the image gets overall. It's really hard to relay and express what you see through a camera versus through your actual naked eye step for step, beat for beat. I try to get it as close as possible, but this thing really is just frustrating at the top magnification ranges. And it's just frustrating on so many different levels because not only does the image get darker, but the exit pupil becomes so small, the eye relief becomes so tight, the chromatic aberration creeps up significantly more, and it takes an overall wonderful experience. The controls in this thing are all very good. And the glass, albeit up above 25x is stellar backing it out to about an indicated 25x just look at the difference that we have between this and at 30x this is a beautiful looking image and truth be told if this was a four and a half to 25 there'd be less to complain about because you'd have a better looking image in fact i bet you if it was a four and a half or a five to 25 the glass would perform even better because it's trying to do less overall work backing it out to about 20x and you can see Damn, that looks even better. Yeah, because over here, the glass is, quote-unquote, less stressed. It's doing less work. I really wish companies would just realize, you know what? Instead of selling numbers, like car manufacturers will sell you horsepower. They'll say, oh, we have 400. And another company will go, oh, well, we have 401. And another company will go, oh, we have 405. But they don't talk about the torque. 
Oh, we have 400 horsepower, but 400 foot-pounds of torque. Oh, we have 405 horsepower, but 230 foot-pounds of torque. There's a huge difference between those two numbers and the power bands overall as a use, from a usability standpoint. This scope might be a 4.5 to 30, but it reacts much better as a 5 to 25. And maybe if they just built a 5 to 25 and kept everything else as good as possible, they would truly have a wonderful scope on their hands. Instead, they have a bit of a lackluster one. Because what's the point of having a 30x scope if you can't really properly, efficiently use all 30x? It's like saying you have the, the most beautiful girlfriend in the world, but she's a, a sloppy, wet fish. And so it's like... She just does nothing. It's like, it doesn't matter how good looking you are, just how beautiful you are. If you just lay there like a plank of wood, it's kind of boring. Yeah, I made that analogy. Here, 900 yards, power tower, maximum magnification. The center is brighter than the outside. You have this weird, like, fisheye brightness effect, which you only really see in the worst of times. And this scope is performing that at the worst of times. Bring it back out to 25x real quick before we bring it up to 30 and we start shifting the eye box. Well, you'll see that eye box is really tight and it is instantaneous going from picture perfect in the middle, which still isn't perfect, to adjusting it. I'm talking about thousandths of an inch either direction and you will notice the shadows creeping in significantly, significantly worse. Bringing it to 20x is a much better performance and on par with what we've seen with a lot of 5 to 25s. Again, no surprise there. I wish... I wish companies would just be like, you know what? We're going to do what Night Force does, and we're going to make an attacker-style scope that's a 4 to 16, and it's going to be perfect from minimum to maximum and everywhere else. But they don't because, again, oh, I got more magnification than everybody else. It's going to be uh, – everyone's going to buy my scope. This is not the better way of producing such a scope because 25X is basically as good as the eye box and exit pupil get. We start going down in magnification, but it doesn't really get significantly better better from 25x typically you'd start off at the highest magnification work your way down or at least here that's what i do and it'll go from tight and then it'll slowly start to open up open up open up open up open up and you'll see a progression it opens up at 25 from 30 but then from like 25 to like 10 it stays about the same and then of course here at four and a half it opens up even more but just note that the image falls apart off center rather abruptly and that's either if you're on a very rigid setup like that, or if you're here doing a very dynamic approach to the exact same sort of problem. At the 4.5x minimum, you can see we can get it to the point where we could really see almost none of the scope body. But the image looking through it really starts to warp. You get a lot of fish eyeing effect going on, and the image does fall apart rather quickly. So it doesn't matter how much the scope body you see versus what you're looking through it. Again, if the image doesn't really look all that great. Bumping it up to about 10x here, you can see that... It actually performs a little bit better than it does at 4.5x. Keep in mind, the illumination is on full. And again, I like the fact that they chose to illuminate just the center crosshair as opposed to the entire drop reticle. Because at least for me, it draws my eye more to the center, even though it's all, really not all that bright. But you're going to be using it in moments like this where it's twilight. And you want that little bit extra sort of attention to draw your eye where you need to. At 20x here, you can really start to see how tight that eye box really does get. From here, we still have 10x more we can go upwards. That's a lot. You're talking about another 30% of its overall magnification range. We still have the ability to zoom into, and it's already requiring the perfect position behind it to actually get a usable image looking through it. Well, when we bring it all the way up to its maximum of 30x, ladies and gentlemen, you can see I have an extremely hard time trying to get just the perfect view looking through it. Yes, it is a cloudy, overcast evening when I did this. That only means there's less ambient light. So if you get in a darker environment, it's only going to get worse. So without further ado, let's get into a darker environment and let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. Another day, another dollar. This was filmed on another evening when there was very few clouds in the sky. You can clearly see the sun has set over the horizon here at minimum at 400 yards. We actually have pretty decent overall light gathering capabilities. It's about on par with what we see with the naked eye. Illumination on full is nothing to write home about, but again, it could be worse. At about 20x here is going to be as 
high as we can go in the magnification range and still have the most amount of light coming in. At maximum here, you could really see just how dark this image gets. And if you didn't pay attention, let me back it back out to you to about 20, where it will get as good as it can get in the higher magnification ranges. It's a big difference. And that's as good as you're going to get. Any more than that, you're going to have to buy another scope. Odds are you're buying a 4.5 to 30x scope to shoot at farther distances, right? So maybe you want to shoot out to about 1,000 yards like what we have here. At its maximum of 30 yards, like you've seen all the time, it is darker. Pulling it back out to about 25x to really illustrate that for you guys, it gets much brighter and much clearer. Very nice. So 30x in this is really poor, but I'm going to bring it back up there while we dial up the elevation to about 10 mils. Because guess what? If you're shooting out a distance and you need to bring it up about 10 mils, you can't use the reticle at its maximum magnification. It only goes down to about five and a half, just shy of six at six o'clock. So adding my normal suite of 10 mils of elevation, bring our attention back up to the window. I haven't adjusted anything as far as the camera placement, or at least not yet. When I go to do that, just like you already saw earlier with the eye box test, it's near on impossible to get it perfect without having the shadows creep in on the opposite side. It's really not great, but I get it as close as I can to get it as centered as possible. And I adjust the side focus a little bit to sharpen up the image and it does get much better than what it was before I adjusted the side focus. It's still not great, but it's still not the worst performance I've seen here by a long shot. But again, we are at 30x. So if we were to back it out a little bit more, it would be better. But still, it leaves a lot to be desired, this scope. From all that being said, let me finally get some side-by-side -side comparisons in for all of you to enjoy and to really start to understand what I'm referring to when talking about the striker. First up is going to be the Bushnell Match Pro ED, or the MPED for short. The MPED is a 5 to 30 by 56 with a 34 millimeter tubed HPVO that comes in around the $700 price point. As far as the weight between these two, there's only about three and a half ounces difference with the MPED being the lighter of the two. As far as our overall field of views, they are basically on par with one another at their minimums, but at the maximum, the MPED has 4.1 feet versus the Delta's 3.72 feet. And here at 30 yards, you can see there's already a sizable difference, primarily in the amount of shadows we see on the outside edge of the images. The striker, well, I've beaten that to it within an inch of its life, so we'll talk about the MPED. There's almost none. It really requires you to be in a slightly off position on the MPED to really notice any sort of optical problems with it. Yeah, it's only a Chinese-made optic. Yeah, it's only about 700 bucks, but yeah, it performs extremely well. And the farther out of distance we go, the more noticeable that will be. Despite there being about a half X difference between these two and the field of views being rated roughly the same, when we're focusing on the exact same distance and the exact same target, basically on the exact same day, you will see that there really isn't that much of a difference, primarily because of the view looking through the MPED is so much larger. And as a result, it just makes the overall experience that much better. But once we increase both of these to their maximum of 30x at 400 yards and slightly tweak the side focuses to get everything perfect, you can say what you want. They are a little bit similar, but the MPED still costs less than half the price of the striker. But the MPED still does have a brighter looking image, a little bit better contrast to my eye and less chromatic aberration. It's not without some chromatic aberration, but it is much less noticeable. The colors also seem to pop a little bit more with the MPED, which is something that I'm a big fan of. The striker just seems to be a little bit more on the muted side. Another thing to take into consideration is that these were not filmed on the same day. It just looks like they were because the weather on both of these were very, very similar, almost identical. But the sun could be in a slightly different position in the sky. The humidity could be a little bit different. The air density could be a little bit different. And thus, it could play havoc on one scope versus the other. But for all intensive purposes, it's as close as I could really get without filming them literally at the exact same time. The MPEG just looks a little bit better to my eye, and the view looking through it is much, much larger, and that 
for me is something that I truly enjoy, especially when the overall resolution of the glass is at least on par with another scope that we're looking at with a smaller view looking through it. Because there's two ways of really doing things. It's you have a larger view looking through it, like what the MPEG has, but typically the resolution of the glass isn't going to be as high as a smaller view looking through a scope that might have more resolution. It's like taking a, a JPEG off the internet somewhere and you want to blow it up to a poster. You're going to see some pixelation. It's the exact same concept as opposed to taking a larger JPEG and then scaling it down where it's going to be a lot sharper, a lot clearer. It's not going to fall apart. In fact, if anything, it's going to just increase its overall resolution and thus have more information in a smaller area. So that's typically what happens between two scopes when you have a smaller view looking through one versus a larger view looking through the other. But every once in a while, you can manage to get a large view looking through a scope that also has a really good image in high resolution because they're using good glass and they're using good techniques to make that scope. And the MPEG is one such example that for a very low budget, you can get away with getting a lot. Whew, that was a mouthful. Now, I will be honest, if you're looking really closely at the trees in the background, the striker might have a little bit more resolution on some of the finer details back there. And like piggybacking off of what I just said, it makes sense because of how much smaller the view looking through the striker is as opposed to the MPEG. But again, for the price, the MPEG being less than half the price that is, and with a much larger view looking through it, I'm okay with that because I could see so much more going on. They both have the exact same field of view, but with the MPEG, we're going to be slightly more zoomed in, even though technically the magnification ranges are exactly the same. As far as the exit pupil size, the MPEG is a little bit more forgiving, but the striker does have one ace up its sleeve, which is in, in the higher magnifications. Both the image and the reticle seem to be pretty sharp until you get in deep into the shadows, whereas the MPEG might not be as forgiving in that regard. But the exit pupil does seem larger with the MPEG primarily because when we're at the maximum magnification, the image doesn't get anywhere near as dark and you're able to get behind it a little bit easier. If you haven't watched my MPEG review, go watch that because that really is a budget masterpiece. It's time to bring up a scope that you guys haven't seen yet. It is the Tract Torque 4.5 to 30 by 56. There are a lot of similarities between these two scopes that really ought to be addressed. The first thing to note is that no, these were not filmed on the same day. Again, just the same time of year, but multiple days have passed between both of these. The Torque comes in at, you guessed it, about $1,700, about the same price as the Striker. They're the exact same magnification ranges. As far as the field of views, guess what? They're both identical. They're both made in Japan. And... Their eye reliefs are about the same. That's one thing I didn't talk about with the striker in full depth, so I'll talk about it now. The eye relief on the Delta is 3.2 to 3.8. That's a large swing. Typically, when you have a large swing like that, you have to worry about eye box issues, and that's exactly what we have. At least with the Torque, we have a shorter swing of 3.6 to 3.8 inches. And if you're curious about what the MPEG is, that is a fixed 3.8 inches. So not only do we have a greater distance between our eye and the scope with the MPEG, but we have a larger view looking through it. And again, it just really makes for an awesome, awesome experience behind that thing. But we're not done talking about these two, the Striker and the Toric. The biggest difference with these two are going to be the weight. The Striker comes in about 35.7 ounces, but the Toric at 41.5. It's really significantly heavier. And when we're focusing on this 100-yard paper shoot and see, again, different days, but very similar targets at the exact same distance on the exact same range. The Toric doesn't really look all that good. In fact, it looks like at a maximum magnification of 30x, we're having similar-ish problems as far as the overall light transmission at maximum. Well, that is because it does have a very similar issue to the Delta in that regard. Not only that, but the image never seems as sharp as what the striker can produce. That's one thing I got to give it to the striker. When you get it just right, it can produce a very fine looking image. The torque always seems a little bit muddy. And again, that harkens back to the 4 to 20 review that I did quite some time ago. So is that just a symptom of the track torque lineup or is it just a coincidence? Well, 
the gentleman that lent me this 4.5 to 30 also lent me the 4 to 20, so you'll be finding out on both of these very soon. Pushing our targets back to about 200 yards, we're going to slowly just bring up the magnifications again to see if there's any real noticeable difference between these two image quality wise. Well, yeah, there kind of is. The striker produces a sharper looking image, albeit a darker one above 25x, whereas the torque might let in a little bit more light at the maximum, but the image just doesn't really like speak to me all that much. I didn't bring the striker here all the way up. I left it at about 20x like an idiot, but uh, You'll see once we start pushing out our distances a little bit further, I will not make that same mistake twice. But again, you're going to see the exact same sort of, how should I say, issues with both of these. A darker image on the striker, albeit a sharper one, and on the Torque, a brighter image, but yet a less sharp looking one. Neither of these are what I'd consider to be truly top tier. And for the price point, I was expecting a little bit more, I must be honest. Both of them have wonderful, wonderful build quality, but the Torque, I think, edges it out ever so slightly. But neither of them really feel or operate like $1,700 scopes. I'm sure a lot of people out there are going to be saying, ah, oh, well, you can get them on sale if you're LEO or military or whatever. You can get a really good discount from Tract, and you're absolutely right, you can. And... I'm fine with that. I appreciate that. And I appreciate that they're made in Japan, but uh, it's just, it just seems like it's missing something. Between those two, which would I buy? I didn't even mention that. Uh, it was pretty self explanatory with the MPEG. It's going to be the MPEG. But I'd probably buy a PST Gen 2 over either Tract or the Striker. You want to talk about another budget beauty? The PST Gen 2 5 to 25 is the only 5 to 25 that we're going to be looking at today. But man, oh man, just look at how beautiful that image is at 5x. Holy cow. It might be one of the oldest models that we're going to be looking at. But holy hell, did they know what they were doing when they put together the scope. And by them, I refer to the Filipino OEMs that made it for Vortex. Because damn, 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 does it still perform extremely well. There is a full PST Gen 2 5 to 25 video coming out very soon, along with a full comparison of all the HPVOs in the Vortex lineup. But until then, let's just focus on the Striker versus the PST. Focusing on our 100 yard paper targets, you might notice that these targets look kind of similar, and that's because these were filmed on the exact same day. Just slightly different targets between which ones I shot at first and which one was second. Clearly, I filmed the PST first, then the striker. But to run down some of the numbers, the PST Gen 2s can be found for around a grand, which is a lot of money despite the fact of how old they are. It is only a 5 to 25, but it doesn't matter if the 25X looks better than the 30X with the striker. As far as our overall field of view, it's basically on par with what we see with the striker. You got 24.1 feet at its minimum as opposed to 24.7, and 4.8 at its maximum as opposed to 3.7. But that's the difference between that, again, 5X at the maximum between these two. As far as the weight goes, the PST is going to be a little bit lighter, about 4.5 ounces lighter. And the eye relief is going to be right smack dab in the middle of what the delta is at 3.4 inches fixed, which means we will not have any eye box issues, which you can very clearly see is not an issue with the PST. I also think the PST has better color representation and more contrast, despite the fact it's a 30 millimeter tube and only a 50 millimeter front objective, it really does slap the striker in the face when it comes to overall just experience behind the scope. Again, colors and contrast. And not to mention that significantly larger view looking through it. I really am a sucker for a giant view looking through the scope, especially when the glass matches just how bet massive it is. Perfect case in point, the Night Force NX8 2.5 to 20. Yeah, it might not be the same resolution of the attackers but wow is it just breathtaking to get behind 200 yards on both of these targets at the exact same time of day the exact same day you name it and again that 5x really doesn't seem like it's making that much of a difference between the pst and the striker it goes to the pst yeah it doesn't have locking turrets uh the reticle options might be a little bit more limiting the the, the real minutiae stuff about personal preferences will come into effect just kind of like what I said during the MPED review, when I compared the MPED to the PST Gen 2, it comes down to if you have a PST Gen 2 and you're using it on a trainer versus a Razer HD, or if you just want the MPED, 
it's going to really depend on which one you want to go for. But between these two, it's going to be PST Gen 2 all day long. And because I mentioned it, I might as well roll in some footage, even though this is very old, antiquated, and overblown footage. It is too bright. I didn't adjust my exposure settings properly on my camera when I filmed with the Razer HD Gen 2. So just take it for what it's worth. Uh, I'm going to have to redo the Razer HD Gen 2 4.5 to 27 by 56 because I really do think it is the best HPVO for the price. Not for the weight, because the weight is enough to bludgeon someone to death in about two full powered swings but as far as everything else it's 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 friggin amazing speaking of the weight it is 13 ounces heavier than the striker price point on these they've gone up unfortunately two grand to 2500 you can find them used for like the mid thousands basically the exact same price point as the striker and for me it just seems like it's a much better scope for the money Field of view is significantly larger with the Razer HD Gen 2s. Both of these at their minimums, which are identical at 4.5x, you're talking about 25.3 feet versus 24.7 feet. It might not sound like a lot, but it really does add up. Inches really do equal feet. And at their maximums, you're talking about 4.4 feet at 27x with the Razer HD versus 3.7 feet at 30x with the Striker. Both of them at their maximums at 200 yards, despite the fact that, again, I hopelessly messed up the exposure settings with the Razer HD when I filmed this segment. It's still just a vastly superior scope. And the Razer's eye relief is about 3.7 inches, which is good and as far away as the Delta could possibly get at about 3.8 inches. But again, it goes from 3.8 to 3.2 inches, which is really its Achilles heel as far as really messing with the overall tightness to the eye box at its maximum magnification between these two there is no comparison ladies and gentlemen it's going to be the razor hd gen 2 and that is going to very abruptly bring us to my final thoughts you might think i'm shilling for vortex it's not the case vortex just so happens to make really really good scopes delta does too the second focal plane striker hd 1 to 6 by 24 like i said in the beginning of this video is a benchmark it is a wonderful wonderful lpvo I was hoping that this HPVO would carry the torch of the 1-6, to and it just doesn't. Front focal plane scopes in general are much harder to manufacture. And when you really think of it, this is technically a 4.5 to 30, so it's more than a 6x multiplier. The 1-6 to second focal plane is a 1-6, to but it's second focal plane. So this is more than a 6x multiplier. You might be saying, but see, there are companies that make like 7 to 35s. But if you divide those two numbers together, what do you get? You get 5x. That's not 6 plus x. So a 7 to 35 can technically perform better than this simply because the magnifier is of a lower magnitude. And thus, it's going to be easier to have it just work better. I was kind of hopeful when I got my hands on this. Typically, Japanese-made scopes are of a little bit higher caliber than most. And you could really feel it in the overall physicalities of this thing. It feels really good in hand and it looks really good. It's got some really interesting features like that plunger rev indicator on the elevation. I've never seen anything like that before. And I do see it as something that's either going to allow for dirt and debris to get in or just have it get jammed up somehow. It just, I, I get it. I don't really think I need it. You know, there are better, easier ways of performing such a, a task, such as like a little nub that pops up as opposed to this giant erector tube in the middle. But that's what Delta decided to try to do with this. I guess it's one way of trying to be different, just like they wanted the reticle to be a little bit different. It is absolutely different. Uh, at its minimum, you don't really notice the center until you get to about here at about 10x when, yeah, you could just start to make out like where that center crosshair is and all the drops, but it's still not really all that practical or usable until about this magnification, if not a little bit more. I've been noticing that more and more recently with like MPVOs of the 3 to 18 variety that the reticle just doesn't seem to correlate properly to the magnification range. It's not just Delta's problem with this. It's just across the entire board, really. But the reticle is definitely the lesser of the two negatives with the scope. The darkening to the image at 30x is by far the worst, and the tightness or the rather smaller exit pupil is the cause of that. That is by far the worst. 
This again has the worst eye relief swing that I've seen in a long time. 3.8 to 3.2 inches is rather abruptly large, but where I have it is as good as it could possibly get for me to capture through it and still have it be as true to form as possible. You can see here, it's so tight at 30x. And when we adjusted the elevation at the thousand yard setup, you saw it firsthand. It's really, really, really tight. Even when you make a minor adjustment with the elevation, you got to adjust your head. Now it happens with a lot of scopes, but typically they don't have as dark of an image at their maximums. This is just worse. It's honestly a bit of a letdown because I was hoping a little bit more for the scope. However, if you have one and you enjoy it, then my words aren't going to matter worth a damn because you have it and it gives you joy and you use it. I'm pretty sure for anyone that has this and they are using it, they really don't have much to complain about except for like the nuance stuff. Okay, so it gets really dark at 30x. Leave it at 25x. But then you could also buy a scope that's only a 5 to 25 for probably less money and perform a little bit better inside that window of 5 to 25. Because again, it's only a 5x multiplier as opposed to a 6 plus. So take this for what it's worth, ladies and gentlemen. If you're in the market for one of these, maybe look elsewhere. But again, if you're perfectly fine with how this thing functions, then I think you'll be quite satisfied with it overall. Because again, physically, it is wonderful. It's just it's just a few little things at the higher magnification that really, really just turns it off for me. And on that sad note, a huge thank you to the individual that sent this in for review. I truly, greatly, and wholeheartedly appreciate it. And thank you all very much for watching. As always, see you again next time. And a huge thank you to my Patreon providers and my Subscribestar subscribers. Without you, this truly wouldn't be possible. If you'd like to support my channel but don't want to join either of those, I completely understand. But you could still help by using my affiliate links in the description below, and or like, share, and subscribe as always. Again, thank you very much.